Well, here we are outside Bishop's Lodge in Walton. I'm about to go in and interview the Bishop of Liverpool, Paul Bays. Hello and welcome to Faith Matters. This is the show where we take a spiritual perspective on Merseyside life. And today we're at Bishop's Lodge in Wharton, where our guest, well, we're his guests in uh, his house, but our guest today is Bishop Paul Bays, Bishop of Liverpool. Um, welcome to the show. Thank you, Keith. It's good to be with you. Um, Bishop, how, how long have you been Bishop of Liverpool? Yeah, you know, it's such a it's such a long answer, it's such a simple question. It's complicated becoming a bishop. Basically, your wages go up as soon as the Archbishop of York does a legal service, and that happened to me in July 2014. But then th th there are various other things that you have to do. So I didn't actually start in Liverpool. I came into the cathedral with the people there for my installation there in November. So I've been there about 15 months now. Okay, and what what's your backstory? Uh, I know you've you've got an interesting story. I mean, maybe we we all have, but tell us your your backstory. So I was um, brought up in Yorkshire. I'm a Yorkshire guy, so although I'm a funny guy, at least I'm a funny Northern guy. Uh, and and originally I was going to do drama and, and and actually work for a TV company. That was my dream. Um, and and I did a degree in drama in Birmingham. This was way back in the late seventies. But after I got the degree, I began to think to myself, you know, what do I really want to do with my life? And some of my friends were going into the theatre or into the media, and they were having a good time there, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I just felt there should be something more to it. So I explored, at that same time, I was coming to faith, I went through a bit of a crisis of faith, went in my late teens, early 20s. So I thought, you know, maybe there's something in this God business, if there is, then maybe he wants my life to be given to something else. And so... I candidated for ministry in the Church of England um, and, and, and went to college in 1976 uh, to learn how to be a vicar. And then for, for many years, for about 20 years, I did pastoral work either in parishes or in university chaplaincies, things like that. And um, um, that, that's, how I, that's how I started out, both in the north of England, northeast is where I started, then in London, then in Buckinghamshire in a multiracial town in Bucks. And, uh, and then down in near Southampton. So I kind of sank down the country rather like a piece of grit and fetched up, uh, fetched up in Southampton in about 2002, 2003. And, and then after that, I'd been doing sort of new ways of doing the church. I'd been planting new churches with people who didn't usually get into the church as it was. And, and, and I really got into that and found that a, a really exciting way to be a, a Christian leader. Uh, and because of that, the, 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 they asked me, the National Church asked me to become a policy advisor and to go and work for the Archbishop of Canterbury in 2003. So for about six years, um, um, I, I became a kind of church bureaucrat and went around the church advising on the way that the church should grow. Uh, and then after that, they decided I should be a bishop. Uh, I guess they thought, you know, if the guy's a bishop, he can't do any more harm. Okay, and did you expect to be a bishop? Is that something one expects, or...? Yeah. It's a, the, if, if you're a bishop in the church, technically, it, it, it's the Queen's appointment. A Queen makes you a bishop. So you can't apply for it. People can ask you whether you'd be interested, and, 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 and you have to fill in paperwork and things like that. So that happened to me uh, in about 2007, 2008, and, and, and it came out of the blue for me. So I had interviews, I filled in the paperwork, left it, and then, you know, n nothing happens. And then suddenly they say, would you be interested? And the first, the first Episcopal job that I had was down in just north of London in Hertfordshire. I was the Bishop of Hertford, which is an assistant bishop's job in, in the Diocese of St. Albans. So I did that job, not for long, actually, just for three and a half years. Uh, but I was able to make all my bishoping mistakes down there before I came to Liverpool. Okay. Um 
So what has been your impression of the city region? Because you, you're not just the Bishop of Liverpool, are you? You're, the Liverpool Diocese extends up to Wigan and yeah, Warrington, right. St Helens and, and, and beyond even Ormskirk. Yeah, absolutely. Two, two thirds of the people in our diocese don't live in the city. So there's the city that goes up to Southport, across to Wigan, as you say, Warrington, St Helens, Widnes, and then back up the Mersey. It, it's not a region that I've lived in before. It's not a region that I knew before. Um, but it is a fantastic region and it's a place that's made us so welcome. And it, it, it's the thing, I remember the Dean of Liverpool, Dean Pete, he said to me, when you've got a port, and Liverpool's been a port for a long time, what ports are good at is welcoming strangers. Because that's how you make your living, by welcoming people from all around the world. And we felt, you know, I, I said when we began to come, there's been a lot of talk these days about migrant workers about people who move to work somewhere else. And, and I, said, I, said to the, I said to the area, I'm a migrant worker. I was, I'm, I'm from the south or I'm from Yorkshire. I'm not from this region, but thank you, I used to say to him, for making me so welcome. And I know this is a region that makes visitors welcome. Even people who've had to run away, refugees or asylum seekers, migrant workers. It, it's, a, it's a place that's always been enriched by folks coming in. And that was the feeling we got. They looked at us and they said, OK, what, what can you, how can we get the best out of you, Paul? And, and that's been my experience here. You know, I've, I've, I've been all over the country, as I said before, in my ministry. But I've never been to a place where the welcome has been so sustained. You know, some places you go, people say, oh, hello, how are you? And that's it. You're expected to get on with it. But here it's not been like that. Yeah, I've, found, I've found that yeah, as well, yeah. coming from the south. Fantastic. That's, that's yeah. right. And that's, and, and that's the experience of a lot of us, you know, who've, who've, who've come here, people have dropped, taken us to their hearts. And, and when that happens, you want to give them your best, mm. which is certainly what I want to do here. And what about the, the let's come back to Liverpool as a city, what, what about the spiritual temperature of the city? How, how are you finding that, the, the kind of spirituality of Liverpool? England's in a funny old place when it comes to faith now. We've got a long history of, of faith across the country. Um, and at the same time, quite, quite a lot of younger people now can't see the point in believing. Or, or, or they, they say, if you ask them, they say that they're spiritual but not religious. What, what I found in Liverpool, because the Roman Catholic Church has been so strong here, and I've got great relationship with the Archbishop, Archbishop Malcolm, uh, the Roman Church has been strong here, and we've been pretty strong here over the last 30, 40 years. There's a platform for faith in Liverpool that I've not seen in many other cities, and I've worked in a number of large cities. And, and that comes, I think, from a number of things. It, it, it comes from the extraordinary leaders that we've had in the churches in previous generations. So Bishop David Shepherd uh, and Archbishop Derek Warlock, you know, in those days when perhaps the Roman Church and the Anglican Church didn't get on so well. These two guys said, we're going to be friends, and our friendship is going to be something that we want to offer to the city. And then, as we know, they led the city not only in terms of faith, but also on the poverty agenda. They spoke out for jobs. They spoke out for justice. And I think people in the city recognize that and respond to it. And if you see faith actually cashing out in terms of making a difference in people's lives and human flourishing, when you see that, you think, maybe there's something in this. So there's a platform for faith in the city. And of course, it's a multi-faith city now. There are people from a number of different faiths or a, quite a large number from no faith at all. But I've never felt in my short time here that there's a hostility to faith. People want to ask you questions and they rightly want to ask you straight questions about the church and what it's up to and about faith and how it can make a difference. But they want to ask you that from a position of really wanting to know whether we've got something that will help them. And as a person of faith, you can't ask for any more than that. I don't believe, when, when I first started my, my uh, uh, ministry here, I preached a sermon and I said, in the past we used to be in the middle and at the top, but now we're on the edge and underneath. The churches have been pushed to the edge and underneath. And I said, and I believe it still, that's where we should be. Jesus started on the edge and underneath, alongside the poor, trying to help people and build them up and lift them up. So it doesn't worry me that the churches don't have, you know, all the privileged position that they used to do. We're in a fantastic place to make a difference in a city where people want to listen out for that. Okay, and it's uh, it's the beginning of Lent. Um, 
you've been it's Ash Wednesday today. We're recording this. You know, what, what's your message very briefly before we come to our commercial break? For yeah. Lent? Just to, just to say this, you know, God loves people. Ash Wednesday is a time when we think about wouldn't it be great to turn our lives around and do the right thing. Wouldn't it be great to say no to selfishness, to say yes to God's love? That's the message the church has always put out. And Lent, leading up to Easter, we've got such a good message to say. So God loves you. That's the main thing I'd say to everybody listening to this. Okay. Thank you, Bishop. Um, we'll come back after the break with some more questions. Welcome back to Faith Matters. We're here at Bishop's Lodge in Walton with Bishop Paul Bays, the Bishop of Liverpool. And uh, we've been talking about, in the last part of the programme, we've been talking about the church, the state of the church. I want to bring you back to that. Um, your perceptions on where the Church of England is particularly, because obviously the church is more than the Church of England and the whole church is facing the same kind of difficulties. Yeah. But where is the Church of England as the state church? Where are we? We hear a lot of stories about, a lot in the papers about decline and falling yeah. numbers. You know, what, what's your, your take on all that? Yeah, it, it, the, the Church of England's got a strapline and the strapline is this, we want to have a Christian presence in every community. Now, now that's our particular thing, that we want to be there for everybody. Now, now of course, some people don't mind whether we're there for them or not. That doesn't worry us. We, 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 we just want people to know that if they need us, we're there for them everywhere. Now, now that, I was saying before the break, you know, we've got a, a, a church now where people, a lot of people in the country have said no to us, they've turned their back on us, for whatever reason, sometimes frankly because we've not done the best thing by Jesus Christ, you know, we've put them off with our own views, we're always fighting like cats in a sack. It always, it can seem sometimes that, that, that we don't really cash out what we say about love and about faith. Um, when that happens, of course, what we in the church have got to do is to admit it and say, look, we're sorry. J J Jesus is perfect and we're not. We're trying to follow him and get closer to him. And we believe that if we offer God's love, then we're offering a great gift to people. That remains true for us. And, and in the church, really, what I want to say is as England changes, God doesn't change. But as England changes, we, the church, want to be there for them, for people as they are. So we ourselves have better change. So the way that we used to worship or the way that we used to be 60, 70 years ago, in the 1950s when I was a kid, about 60% of people, young people, went to Sunday school. Now, it's, it's, there's hardly anybody goes to Sunday school unless the, the, the children are church parents. That, that doesn't count as a failure. It just means that England has changed. So we've got to respond. And, and in, the, in the Diocese of Liverpool, and this, this predates my coming, so I, I'm taking no credit for this, but not everywhere in the country is the church declining. So in Liverpool for the last two or three years, more people have been coming to our different expressions of church. So traditional church, Sunday morning, the thing people think of when they think of church, but also quite new ways of doing church. Think church that meets in the week, young people's church after school clubs, church that meets in pubs, churches that try and relate to people where they are in their networks, all, all those things are ways that in Liverpool we've been trying to pioneer. And, and the evidence seems to be that when you offer people the opportunity to ask questions, to chew the fat with people, to talk about their own issues and problems, to get real with Christian people who are getting real, then the attractiveness of the church is still there. That's what I believe. And, and certainly when I came here, the, 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 the thing that I keep on saying everywhere, the thing that I said from day one is, we want a bigger church. We want there to be more people knowing Jesus. But we don't just want a bigger church to big ourselves up. We want a bigger church so we can make a bigger difference. A bigger church to make a bigger difference. And the difference we want to make is a difference with justice. So when I was launched, people got to know me for the, on the first day. This man's going to be the new Bishop of Liverpool. I asked that that should happen, not in a church building, but in a food bank connected to a oh, church yeah. up, at, up, at, up at St Andrew's Clubmore. I wanted people to see that, that when I was starting, I was starting trying to offer to people in need the love and the resources of Jesus Christ. Now that food bank's got a lot of people helping, not all Christians, not all Anglicans, not all people of faith, but the church has managed to pull people together and offer help 
And, and, and it seems to me that that way of being, being there for the poor, being there for those in need, and also not being afraid to talk about Jesus Christ, a bigger church and a bigger difference, that's what I'm trying to do in, in my own leadership here in the diocese. Okay, uh, at your inaugural sermon, have I got that right? The, the, uh, your investiture, so, I mean, I was there yeah. and um, I was very taken by, by that sermon and um, I've read it since. But one of the things that really struck me was uh, when you said about the, when you spoke about the poor man's table, you wanted to lay a table out in every street, I think you said, yeah. across, across the diocese. Yeah. And I was taken actually to that, there's a, there's a painting in the refectory in the cathedral of, that, of Jesus yeah. around a table, which yeah. I, I really like. I've tried to take a photograph in the past, but it's quite high. Yeah. Um, do, do you just want to um, speak a bit about that, yeah. that, that vision for the poor man's table? That, 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 was, that was my picture. So, I, so what I said was, you know, imagine that, just imagine there's a table. And of course, we all know Jesus was the son of a carpenter. So I said, imagine there's this table. It's been made by a carpenter. He wants people to sit down at it. He, he wants that table to be there for anybody who's hungry so that he can give them food. That was my picture. And I said to us all, imagine what we can do as part of that. We can work with Jesus to extend the table. Not so we can lord it over people, because Jesus was a poor man. We want to get alongside people where they need us. But everyone needs to know if they want, we wouldn't force anybody, but if they want, there's a place at the table. And if you sit at the table, you sit next to Jesus, who's alive, but you also sit next to the church. And the Archbishop of York says this, and I didn't say this in the sermon, but it's a picture I've always had. He says, when you sit down, when a Christian sits down beside Jesus, he'll feed you, but then he'll also say to you, now, here's a plate and here's a cup. Do you want to go and feed other people? So you're a guest, I'm a guest at the table. But also the, the host, the poor Christ, Jesus, he wants me to help him. And he wants me to help him by feeding other people. And what I said was, we need that table to be in every street and every home where people want to welcome him in. And, and, and I think that, that picture that we're here to feed people and we're not here to lord it over them. We're here to sit alongside people and feed people because we ourselves have been fed. That was the picture I wanted to get out there from day one. And, and, and I'm glad to say that, that quite a lot of people have picked up on that story. There's a church up in Formby who are having a table made in their church. And it says, the table of the poor man, the table of the king, King Jesus. But he's a poor king. Mm. And, and, and that, that image is, I mean, I was delighted when they made that. They, they, you know, they, they, that says it better than I did. But that idea that we sit down and eat with God, that's the Christian story in a nutshell. When I heard you say that, the picture that came into my mind, when I first heard you say it in the cathedral, the picture that came into my mind was of those jubilee celebrations, you know, when the yes, Queen re artists. reaches at a certain age and, uh, and you know, the, the fun and the joy of it and, you know, the whole community gathered in a street. Yeah, and yeah, I, yeah. I literally had a picture of it. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. you know, the church is supposed to be fun, isn't it? Absolutely. It's, it's not supposed I, to be a dry... Absolutely right. And I, and I you know, the... The, when Jesus was with us, according to the Bible, he kept getting accused of being a drunk. He kept getting accused of hanging out with bad company. He had a table and people came to sit at the table and other people got all scandalized about that. So we follow someone who, who laid a table and said to anybody, C -c come and be with us. And, and, and if they were a bit dirty or if they were scruffy or if they got drunk or if they were a problem, Jesus didn't, he, he didn't reject them for that. He said, come and sit at the table. And, and God said to me, I've got, you know, I've got a broken life, like a lot of us do, trying to struggle to do the right thing, all that kind of stuff. But I hear Jesus saying to me, oh, Paul, I love you just as you are, but I love you too much to leave you the way you are. Come and walk with me and put your, turn your life around and put it straight. But the first thing God says is, there's room for you at the table. So the idea, when you were saying about the Jubilee parties, I, I remember as a younger guy uh, 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 going to those, drinking the red, white, and blue lemonade, or trying to force down the blue lemonade. And in that way, you look at it, you think, blue lemonade, that's a funny old drink. But actually, you're drinking it in celebration with other people. And sometimes people look at our communion, our Holy Communion service, you think, communion wine, that's a funny old drink. A little bit of bread, that's a funny thing to be eating and drinking. But actually, what we say with that is what Jesus always said, come and take and eat and, and share my life. And all I want to do as a Christian is offer that life and, and it's such a blessing to be able to offer it here in this region. Okay, you, we, we've 
spoken about Jesus, you know, what he stood for uh, and what he did. He, he was given a hard time by establishment figures and particularly by religious figures yeah. who were in power. And, uh, and he, he gave them a bit of a hard time back on occasions. Yeah. And uh, how does that sit with you? I mean, you sound like a radical follower of Jesus to me. I mean, how do you hold those things in yeah, balance? Yeah, it's, it's difficult. It's, I mean, you know, here we are, here we're in Liverpool. We've we got the, the biggest Anglican church in the world, our cathedral. Fantastic building. Now that's a gift. But it would be so easy for us, if we weren't careful, to get up ourselves about that. Oh, look at us, we're so fantastic. You have to pay to come in. But we try not to do that. We try and say, this is a gift, not, not for us, but it's a gift we want to give to our city and to our city region. So everybody's welcome. Come in, it's free. And, 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 and that is, is, is what I want to do with the church, the history of the church. We've been given a gift, which is that for years people have, have looked to us as people who can help them. We've not always used that gift well. But when we do use it well, we can give it away again. And, and, and the, the, the risk always with Christian leaders is, is that you begin to believe that you're important. It's not true. The, the only thing I've ever had is, is, is the chance to give my emptiness to God, to say, you know, here I am, God, I'm not much without you. Help me out. And, and when in 1979 I got ordained, a long time ago now, and ever since, wherever I've worked, that's what I've tried to say. And, and just now and again, you, you, you know, I, and I've said this to you, Keith, and to all the other, my other sisters and brothers in the, in the clergy in the diocese, I say to them, if you see that I'm just leaving the ground a bit and getting a bit self-important, grab hold of me, pull me down, nail my feet to the floor. Because the Christian church is a, a bunch of sisters and brothers mm. who've got difficult, broken lives, the same as the folks around us, but who've also got a fantastic treasure to share nothing that we've ever done but the thing we've been given and and and, it, and if the leaders of the church forget that then that's the beginning of the end for us now you know w within within liverpool i know the archbishop archbishop malcolm and, and my sisters and brothers in the free churches that they would all say that in their different ways in the world church you look at the pope now you know driving his little fiat you know refusing to drive a limousine the christian leaders when they look to jesus they tend to get it right. Our own Archbishop of Canterbury, who used to be, of course, here in Liverpool at the cathedral. You know, he's a guy who's said that he wants to share his faith, but he also wants to make sure that people don't get ripped off, that there's no credit injustice. And, and, and that, if you listen to Christian leaders all over, what you find is a bunch of people who are trying to do the right thing. More people knowing Jesus, more justice in the world. Well, thank you, Bishop Paul, very much for inviting us to your table today and uh, for being our guest on Faith Matters. And it'd be great to have you back again sometime in the future. And thank you to our viewers for watching and join us next time on Faith Matters. Mm -hmm.